Originally, following his defeat of the Belgi and the Nervii, Caesar's plan was to head directly to the coastal lands of Menapii and Marini tribes, and launch his expedition into Britannia, but events of the 57 BC year played out differently than expected. Having established a definite agenda at Lucca with his fellow triumvirs, Pompeius Magnus and Marcus Licinius Crassus, Caesar rejoined his legions in Gaul, forced to turn his attention to Amorica. The Amorica tribes, led by the Venetii, had executed what Caesar took to be a declaration of war against Rome by kidnapping those who were sent to oversee the distribution of Venetii grain for feeding Caesar's legions during the 57-56 BC winter. They had done this, not only to demonstrate their discontent with being forced to house and feed Gaul's invaders, and to hinder Caesar's invasion of Britannia from financially crippling Gaul's coastal tribes, who relied on Britannia's trade, but also in retaliation to the taking of Venetii hostages following what they deemed peaceful treaties with Rome. Because the surrounding tribes, who would also be affected by Caesar's invasion of Britannia, had sworn oaths to the Venetii, Caesar had a much larger rebellion on his hands than he had when the Nervii attacked at the Sabis River. Dispatching two of his legates to critical areas, Caesar sought to weaken the Venetii alliance. Publius Crassus, the son of Triumva, Marcus Licinius Crassus, who had been given his legateship as part of Caesar's alliance with Crassus, rather than through holding the appropriate offices or commands, was sent to the tribes that made up the area of what would eventually be known as Aquitaine. After raising more troops in Provence, Publius Crassus faced the Sociates, who attacked while the army was marching. Using their cavalry, the Sociates struck the marching column, fighting until they were forced to withdraw. When Publius Crassus' army pursued the retreating cavalry, they were ambushed by Sociates' infantry, who had laid in wait in the nearby valley, where the cavalry had lured the Romans. Caesar describes the battle as long and fierce stating that the Sociates fought as though the safety of all Aquitaine hinged upon their bravery. However, with the Romans determined to demonstrate what their young military officer could accomplish, even without the guidance of a commander-in-chief, the Sociates eventually fled the field of battle following heavy casualties. After slaying as many fleeing Gauls as possible, Crassus turned and marched his army straight to their stronghold. Although the Sociates offered a substantial resistance, Crassus's building of siege towers and mantlets rendered him ultimately doomed to defeat. Finally, the Sociates sent out deputies to request Crassus accept their surrender, and Crassus agreed. As the legions were engaged in watching them deliver all their arms to Publius Crassus, their chief, a man named Adiatunus, used approximately 600 men, referred to as vassals, to renew the fighting from another quarter of the town. Unfortunately for the Sociates, a cry went up, and the Romans formed ranks so fast that Adiatunus's attempt failed. Once again, he asked to be allowed to surrender, and once again, Crassus reiterated the terms of the Sociates' first surrender. After defeating the Sociates, Crassus continued on towards the south, where he engaged the Vocates and Terusites tribes, which proved to be a much more difficult task. The Vocates and Terusites, having supported Quintus Sertorius's rebellion against Rome in Hispania, had been trained in guerrilla warfare by the Marian commander, and knew to avoid attacking the Romans outright, choosing instead to harass their baggage trains and marching columns without direct engagement. Suffering blows by the hit and run tactics, Crassus, who realized the Vocates and Terusites would not attack, searched out their military encampment. With over 50,000 men inside, but fortified only on the front side, Crassus marched his army around the camp, and surprised them with a rear attack. When the slaughter was over, Publius Crassus wrote that only 12,000 Vocates and Terusites survived. Caesar's other legate, Quintus Titurius Sabinus, was sent to the area later known as Normandy. There, he set his military camp on a large hill amidst the combined tribes of the Lexovi, Curiosolites, and the Unelli. By remaining in his camp during the attacks by these tribes, Sabinus allowed him to believe he was afraid to come out and face them. Then, by giving commands to his encamped men that gave the outside impression he meant to secretly withdraw from the area in the dead of night, he baited the tribes into a false hope of victory. Rallying all their men, the combined tribes stormed up the hill to attack the Romans before they could leave. 
At the top of the hill, with the Gallic soldiers weak and trying to catch their breath, Sabinus opened the portcullis, and out poured his armed legions, easily defeating the exhausted Gallic soldiers. After their defeat, the tribes offered up all of Normandy to the Romans. Caesar, himself, marched his remaining four legions straight for the Venetii, but failed to engage them in direct combat. After fortifying all their hilltop towns and villages, the Venetii and their allies remained near the water. Wherever Caesar went, the Venetii evacuated their ships to a new location, leaving Caesar nothing but ghost towns to conquer. After playing their cat and mouse game for some time, Caesar commanded Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus, whom he had put in charge of his newly built fleet, to engage the Venetii on the waters. Unfortunately, this proved difficult for the Roman ships, which were built for transport and warfare on the smooth and calm Mediterranean Sea, whereas the Venetii ships were smaller and stronger, built for tumultuous waters such as the Gulf of Morbihan, Bay of Biscayne, and the English Channel. Additionally, Venetii boats were powered by sails, whereas the Romans used oarsmen. And, because the Venetii constructed their boats with sturdy oak beams, they were immune to ramming, the method by which Roman ships usually were able to defeat the flimsy vessels of the Mediterranean. Because Rome, as a military machine, grew to dominance on the strength and sheer numbers of her infantry legions, Naval battles initially placed Rome at a disadvantage until, against the Carthaginians, Rome finally discovered a way to fight land battles on the sea. By connecting a retractable drawbridge called a corvus to the opposing ships, soldiers could then board the enemy vessels and defeat them in hand to hand, infantry style combat. Against the Venetii, Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus sought to employ this method except that the sailing capabilities of the Venetii vessels made him highly maneuverable. Using grappling hooks, Decimus Brutus commanded his ships to shred the Venetii sails, as well as to destroy their ships' outrigging. Without these, the Venetii ships were sitting ducks. Decimus Brutus could now pull alongside them, and with the Corvus boarding bridge, easily defeat his opponents. The majority of the Venetii fleet, realizing they were losing the Battle of Morbihan, pulled back in an attempt to escape. Unfortunately, a loss of wind forced them, like the others, to sit and wait for the Romans to approach on all power, easily defeating them. Having lost their naval force, the Venetii surrendered to Caesar. To make an example of them to the remainder of Gaul, Caesar first executed the Venetii leaders, then sold the majority of the Venetii people into slavery. With the Venetii rebellion finally put down by June of the 56 BC year, Caesar turned his attention back to the Menapii and Marini tribes along the Belgic coast of the English Channel. In order to launch a successful excursion to Britannia, Caesar needed to pacify these tribes, as their coastal lands represented the easiest and nearest crossing point to the island of Britannia, as well as having many harbours from which Caesar's ships could launch. Because the Menapii and Marini tribes had allied with the Venetii against Rome, Caesar marched towards their lands with a large show of force, hoping to frighten the Menapii and Marini tribes, and dissuade him from launching an attack against Caesar's legions. The tribes, however, escaped by withdrawing into the marshlands. And, because the autumn of 56 BC turned out to be wet, and filled with storms, Caesar's legions were unable to pursue them. This caused Caesar to put off his invasion of Britannia because, with the Menapii and Marini tribes hiding in the safety of the large marshlands, launching his legions would be much too risky. The density and size of the marshlands made him the perfect place from which the tribes could successfully launch guerrilla attacks. And so Caesar had no choice but to postpone Britannia. As the 56 BC campaign season drew to a close, Caesar, whose supply trains would have been vulnerable to hit-and-run attacks within the marshes, decided to pull back from the coastal lands and winter his legions in the same Belgic area he had begun the 56 BC year. Once in winter camp, Caesar released the legion of soldiers he had promised to Crassus and Pompeius during their meetings at Ravenna and Lucca. As approximately 5,000 of his soldiers made their way towards Rome, so as to affect the outcome of the consular elections, Caesar settled into his winter quarters, planning his strategies for the upcoming 55 BC spring.